Good morning, everybody. Welcome to today's 1 million by 1 million strategy roundtable for entrepreneurs. 1M1M, as you know, is the first and only global virtual incubator and accelerator in the world. Our mission is to help a million entrepreneurs reach a million dollars and beyond in annual revenue, build a trillion dollars of global GDP and 10 million jobs. We're headquartered in Silicon Valley, but we work with entrepreneurs all over the world. So you will encounter today and in every session, entrepreneurs from all over the world. This is our 266th free online mentoring session. So, you know, this has been going on for a while. We have quite a bit of experience and uh, track record in this. And uh, the recording of this event will be available later after the show on our blog as well as on our YouTube channel. Um, if you want to live tweet the show, you can use hashtag 1M1M. And uh, to follow us on Twitter, our handles are at 1M by 1M and at Stromana. Both of those are, uh, you know, very high content rich channels. And uh, as I said, the recordings will be available at 1M1M Roundtables channel on YouTube. All prior recordings are available there. Now these are the numbers for calling in. We are not quite ready for calling in, but I put these up to uh, underscore the point that you should be thinking about asking questions. The more you engage, the more you ask questions during this session, the more you're going to learn and the more you're going to get out of it. So please think as you're going through the session with us, please think about what questions come to your mind and do not be shy about asking them. This is a safe place. It's a working session. So we're going to have 30 minutes of, uh, you know, conversation with our guest of honor, Pavin Parikh. And then we're going to have a mentoring session with three entrepreneurs and then eventually we're going to have open Q&A. So it is a place where you can safely come and uh, deal with your issues and we'll, you know, try to help you as much as possible. So file away your questions. You can use either the call-in instructions or the public chat to ask them. Now, um, as you know, we are continuing with our celebration of the Entrepreneur Journeys book series. We've released 12 volumes of Entrepreneur Journeys books since 2008, and Billion Dollar Unicorns is the latest in the series that came out in January. So uh, definitely look up the series on Kindle. And let me welcome Bhavin Parikh, co-founder and CEO of Magush, for a special conversation as part of the Roundtable series. Bhavin is doing an amazing job of building a you know, company on a shoestring, really. And I was so thrilled when I met Bhavin that uh, his philosophy of how he's thinking about his company, how he's building his company, is completely in line with the 1M1M philosophy of capital efficient, you know, bootstrapped entrepreneurship. So welcome, Bhavin. We are looking forward to learning more about your journey. Yeah, thanks, Ramana. I'm uh, excited to be here and uh, excited to chat with you. So, Bhavin, let's start. Uh, as I said, you know, our philosophy here is really lean, capital efficient entrepreneurship, exactly what you're doing. So when I first spoke with you, I was blown away by how capital efficient and how disciplined you've been in building Magush. Magush, by the way, folks, is a company here based in Berkeley. Um, and so, Pavin, tell us about the company, what you do, and how you've managed your capital strategy, what your thought process is, and, and what you're trying, what, what are you going to do going forward as a starter? And then I'll double click down on various issues. Sure. So why don't I start with an intro to Magooch. So we help students prepare for standardized tests, like the GMAT to get into business school, the GRE for grad school, the SAT or ACT for high school, even TOEFL uh, for students who were English may not be their first language. Um, instead of paying thousands of dollars for a class or a tutor, students pay about $100 roughly uh, one time for our product, and they're seeing you know, great, sometimes even better results than the traditional methods of prep. We really started Magoosh about uh, to level the playing field for education. Uh, we found that students who had more access 
and more means tended to do better and achieve sort of their longer-term dreams. And so what we wanted to do is find a way to give more people an opportunity to achieve a higher education and change the trajectory of their careers and their lives. And so that's how we started. And it was really me and a few co-founders prior to going to uh, business school at Berkeley for our MBAs, we had to take the GMAT, and we went through this frustrating process. And so then while we were in business school, this was in 2009, roughly, 2008 to 2010, we decided we wanted to work on Magoosh and really change the dynamic of test prep and education more broadly. And that's how we started. Now getting into how we've grown. So like you said, we really put an emphasis on being lean and, and capital efficient. I mean, in our early days, it was just whatever money we could scrape together ourselves. And um, even from there, we were able to take the business from zero, uh, no product, to about 10,000 and 10 to 15,000 in monthly revenue. And, and really the way we did that was uh, while in school, we started doing our research. I mean, we made some mistakes, and so we said, okay, let's see if the problem that we are solving is actually worth solving. And let's see if we talk to our classmates and we survey them, if this is something they'd be interested in. And the first time around, our idea was more students helping other students. And we spent some time and energy in that, and um, probably didn't talk to as many people as we should have. And after about, say, three to six months, we had sort of built this product and put it out there, and we found that no one was interested in this. People thought it was a horrible idea. Mm -hmm. And that was because students didn't want to learn from other students. They wanted to learn from experts. And we could have easily sort of figured that out had we talked to people earlier in the journey. So that was the first lesson. So the second time around, rather than building anything, rather than writing one line of code, we began by surveying and talking to people and understanding what they were looking for in a test prep uh, experience in an online product in a class, what, what was meaningful for them. And then instead of uh, writing code, and Sharon, I think I talked to you about this before, we created PowerPoint fake websites. So we, we opened up PowerPoint, we created like a fake website, just black and white and text, no colors. Um, we made buttons that were clickable to another slide. And then we sat down with our classmates and said, hey, interact with this website. Tell us what you think. We'd sit down with two or three of them. We'd do a usability test. We'd get their feedback, and then we would change up the PowerPoint and then do it again with three more people. And that, to me, was um, it really demonstrated that you don't have to necessarily write code. I mean, I, I did my undergrad in computer science, and we could have done, gone that route, but it would have taken longer, and you would have focused on these details. And before focusing on the details, you want to make sure the big idea is right. And you want to make sure that the user experience and the flow is right. And so we got to a point where we kept iterating on the PowerPoint. And then we finally had a flow where people said, oh, if this were a real website, I would sign up or I would buy. And that's when we started writing code. That's really the, the early days. And that philosophy of not writing code early on is actually also completely consistent with the one million by one million uh, methodology. We actually ask you to validate before you write code. So there is this one school of thought where write a code and get an MVP out there and, and go start kind of see if it sticks. We don't espouse that philosophy. We espouse more the philosophy of what Pavin is describing of maybe using mock-ups and you know, in his case, he used PowerPoint to mock up. There are ways to mock up your, um, you know, your concept and then really talking to customers, potential customers, to understand what is sticking. And that's, that's totally, totally consistent with uh, what, uh, you know, what we promote as well. Pavin, what about, I know you raised a very little amount of capital to get this far. And, and by, by the way, folks, by this far, Pavin is already in the five to $10 million revenue range. I'm not going to be very specific, and I don't know if Pavin wants to be more specific than that. He can be if he wants to be, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but, but it's a, this, is a, this is a company that's generating very substantial revenue at this point. It's amply validated, but it's been done really on shoestring capital. So talk a little bit about your capitalization. How did you raise money? When did you raise money? 
what were the what was the thinking behind that yeah so we we got that first product out and we got to a point where we were doing about 10 to 15,000 a month in revenue and then we had to decide do we want to raise some external funding or do we want to try to bootstrap and i think that's always a tough uh decision for an entrepreneur um i had a lot of misconceptions about raising funding especially yeah. a seed round i thought that that meant we'd be giving up control that um that basically everything would change and uh, what I realized later is that it's not black and white. There are many shades of gray. It depends on who you're raising funding from. It depends on your relationship with them. It depends on the amount you're raising. And my co-founder, luckily, who is smarter than I, he he uh, basically encouraged us to raise funding because what he saw was our growth trajectory had stagnated a bit. And part of that was because we couldn't invest in the future. Um, we were doing 10 to 15,000 a month, but some of that was going to a partner who was helping us with distribution. Some of that was going to a developer who we were paying. And, you know, in the end, we really couldn't pay ourselves anything. And you want to make sure this business continues, and we saw a lot of potential. So we decided to try to raise roughly $750,000. Um, so I know in these days that's, that's probably not considered a lot. Even then, it wasn't necessarily considered a lot. But what we found was uh, – by making that decision, we would be able to make some investments and make some bets that would potentially really help us grow the business. Uh, but at the same time, we didn't want to try to raise so much that we were committing ourselves to a path of exponential, super high growth or bust. We, so we really looked for investors who appreciated what we had done on a shoestring budget on a, and bootstrapping, who understood that we had taken a lot of the risk out of the business but that we don't know if we're going to, you know, swing to the fences uh, and we have that opportunity, uh, but we look for investors who understood that. And another thing I learned during the fundraising process is building these relationships with investors takes a lot of time. You're someone who's going to be with your company forever, so you, you don't want to just go in and meet with them and ask them for money on day one. You want to build those relationships well in advance and Again, my co-founder had actually done that. I, I didn't think about that because I thought we'd just bootstrap the whole way. But luckily, he said, you know, if we decide to raise money, I'm going to start talking to investors. And he was doing that a year before. And I think that really helped us. Um, but we got to a point where we just raised a, a relatively small amount of money, and we were able to take that and make some of these bets and get to a point where we, were, uh, we got to profitability, and that was – the raise was roughly in 2011, early 2011, and we got to profitability by mid-2012. And when did you start the company? And we started it while uh, I was in business school, roughly in 2009. So it was almost, I want to say, two years um, before we raised money. No, we were in school at the time, so but still working, yeah, I'd say, 30 to uh, rough, well, roughly 30 hours a week. Yeah. So it's essentially you started bootstrapping as a student, then you – got to some level of validation, raised a little bit of capital, got to profitability soon after. All this, that whole thing is a two-year phase, and then you accelerated your growth. 2012 to 2015 is a much higher growth period. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we, we've been able to continue accelerating without ex outside capital, and I, I think part of our the reason our business can do that is because it's a high-margin business, so the the money that flows in can go to the business and support our operation. Um, and I recognize not every cracked. business. Sorry? You've also cracked the, uh, you know, the, the levers of growth. And, yes. and that's my next question, actually. It is. Test prep is a highly competitive space, right? So you have been able to carve out a niche and, and really grow fast within that niche. So talk a little bit about your segment and, you know, how you've, Navigated. I know you started with GMAT and then made a switch or a shift to emphasize on GRE as the primary segment. Talk a little bit about all that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we started with GMAT, and we found that the customer acquisition was really hard. I think that's something that I've just seen again and again and again. And one thing that really worked for us uh, was content marketing. It's something that I really believe in. And the idea behind content marketing is we hired an expert tutor who would just write about the GRE or, or the GMAT and share advice and really put things out there for free for people to access. And that does two things. One, it made it discoverable. 
Um, people who would do Google searches would discover our content. We could use that content and post on forums. Um, so many opportunities to do that. But the second thing, and I think what's equally as important, is you don't want to only be discoverable, but you also want to be trustworthy. And that means you have to create excellent content that people really believe, and when they see it, it should really resonate with them, and they should understand that you know what you're talking about. And I think our decision to really hire an expert, someone who'd been tutoring for 10 to 15 years and coached many students to very high scores, really helped us build that credibility. And just on sheer content marketing alone, just creating article after article for a period of, we were doing about one article a day for three months, we went from about 100 or 1,000 visitors a month to 25,000 visitors a month in that three to four month period. Um, and that was all centered around, like you said, Shramana, we, we shifted from the GMAT to the GRE because we found that the GRE was a bigger market in that more students were taking the test and that it was a less competitive market. Um, and it really sort of fit with our mission quite well of um, providing access to a, a wide range of people. And uh, again, Bhavin, I have to say I completely uh, am on the same page with you on content marketing. You know, the only kind of real marketing that we do in One Million by One Million is content marketing. We don't do any other kind of marketing. We don't do any advertising. We don't do anything else. It's all pure content marketing. And, and we amplify all that content very heavily through social media, but it's, it's almost entirely on the basis of content marketing. Yeah, I think that's phenomenal. Even, even this uh, interview itself is a form of content marketing, and I think that's great because it's all about providing value to the audience. Right. So um, now let's switch gears a little bit. I want to, you've talked about customer acquisition through content marketing. I want to understand, or I want our audience to understand, how do you view investment that directly and measurably translate into customer acquisition kind of direct response uh, marketing versus brand awareness related investment, the ROI for which is less obvious in the short term. So uh, it's a slightly more complicated question and content marketing actually does both. It does the direct response more, cu more customer acquisition and also builds a brand in the longer term. So, uh, so talk, uh, talk about how you think about this phenomenon. Yeah, absolutely. So when, and my philosophy is when you have a new product, something that is you're still figuring out, you're still trying to get that initial revenue, uh, you want to focus a lot more on things that are uh, directly measurable. Where you put a dollar in, you can see a dollar back, uh, and you need to think about that payback period. Are you going to see it back in a month or two months? But it, it, in a relatively short amount of time. And part of the reason for that is when you're a young company, um, Time uh, is sort of fighting against you. Money is fighting against you in that you're constantly worried about running out of money. And so if you make a bet that doesn't pay off for three to five years, well, you might not be around in three to five years to recoup that bet. So that's for early products. However, once you start growing your business, um, once you get to a point where you sort of have confidence that your company is going to be around for two, three years because you've really built this engine or you have – the funding or whatever the case is, then I think you want to take some of that marketing budget and allocate it to things like brand awareness. Um, and those, like you said, Shimon, are, are harder to measure. Um, at, at some point, you just have to have faith and believe that the things will work. Um, but those bets typically don't pay off immediately. They're not going to pay off in a month. You're just getting your brand into a consumer's mind today for a purchase decision that may happen in two, three, four years. And so when you have a more mature product, so our GRE and GMAT products, right now I believe maybe around 7% of people who take the GRE or GMAT are paying students of Magoosh. So we, we do focus on brand awareness there. We, we try to think about, well, if we want to grow that to 20% in two or three years, we need to let the world know that Magoosh exists, and that's a really big brand awareness campaign. However, for SAT and TOEFL, which are much newer for us, you know, we think more about how do we measure the ROI of each sort of incremental piece of effort because we haven't yet proven that those will scale. And I think that's a, sort of at least a framework that I would recommend using. Yeah. And, and folks in the audience, just to give you a couple of pointers on this, you know, when you're doing, let's say, a PPC advertising campaign, that's actually pure 
purely quantifiable. You know, you put in a dollar and you have to see whether you're getting back enough ROI on that investment and it's very easy to measure. The place where you will see interesting impact of brand marketing is when you're when you're looking at your organic search statistics and people are actually doing brand search. So in Pavan's case, it's people searching for Magush as a brand, or in our case, people searching for One Million by One Million as a brand or my name as a brand. That's, that's the kind of traffic that is where people are not looking for GRE test prep. They're looking for Magush. They're looking for, they're not looking for a virtual accelerator. They're looking for One Million by One Million. That means that you have actually established a brand out there and, and you know, it kind of gives you a sense of how you're doing in, on a pure brand uh, basis. One more um, switch in topic, uh, Pavin. You, uh, you know, part of building a capital efficient company like you, you're doing is a very sound hiring strategy. Talk to us about your philosophy of hiring, promoting and you know, organization building given your capital efficient structure? Yeah, I, I mean, I want to say this is probably the m most important topic in terms of building an organization because uh, the people who you work with, they're, they're the ones who are going to sort of make the company. Um, and surrounding yourself with exceptional people is really, you know, how you become successful. So our approach um, we do a few things. One is we look for people who are passionate about the mission and passionate about learning. Um, not so they optimize. I, I say uh, we look for people who are optimizing for learning, not optimizing for salary. You know, as a capital efficient organization, you're never going to be able to compete on salary with the biggest companies out there. Um, and if you attract those people who are only interested in sort of earning the most they can, they'll probably work with you for a little while and move on um, and, you know, try to get that next raise or next bump. So what you really want to do is look for people who uh, might not have all the skills you're looking for but have a lot of potential, and you're, instead of, you're giving them an opportunity to learn, an opportunity they wouldn't have at another type of organization. And then if they learn and they prove themselves, then you can give them raises because the company will be doing better and you can promote them. And I really believe if you can, you want to try to promote from within. I think there are exceptions to this, but for the most part, um, you can see how well your team is performing. You can see who is going to be a great individual contributor and you should let them continue to be an individual contributor and compensate them more over time as, as the company grows and as they perform better. And then you can see who's going to be a great manager and you promote them in the management roles and you know, I, I believe that individual contributors and managers are two separate skill sets, but I think it's great to have tracks for both and to do that from within when possible. And if not possible, then to really, when you're hiring externally, we put everyone on a three-month contract. And the reason we do that is we let them opt into the risk of a startup. A startup's always a risky thing. I've had, I've heard from other founders that they've relocated people to work at their company and then fired them within two months. And I think that's just a tough experience for that employee. And that's not something that I would feel comfortable doing. So instead, I say, look, everyone's going to start on a three-month contract. You're going to get full benefits and full pay. You're treated like an employee. But I just want you to know that there's a risk. There's a risk that this might not be right for you, and there's a risk that you might not be right for us. And so I want you to understand that risk going in rather than be surprised if things don't work out. But even if they don't work out, we'll treat you fairly and we'll try to, um, you know, give you some severance and, and all of those things. But overall, it's, it's to make sure that our team is filled with people who are really passionate and excited and are good fits. And, and that's basically how we've done it. You know, I, uh, I've done a lot of bootstrap stories. As you know, I'm, you know, one million by one million is one place where bootstrapped entrepreneurs are celebrated. Um, most of the entrepreneurship media is looking for funding news as the trigger to cover, but we don't look for that. We kind of cover people anyway, as long as they're doing interesting businesses. One thing I've learned, both from my own experience as well as from the stories that we've covered, is bootstrapped companies seldom start with a very experienced executive team. Typically, it is a learning organization. You hire 
you know, a bunch of motivated people, passionate about what the, you know, agenda of the company is. And then there's a lot of learning that happens on the job. You know, we, we all kind of roll up our sleeves as a team and learn all kinds of things and, and implement what we learn as opposed to starting with a huge amount of experience. And, and frankly, I remember when we started One Million by One Million, there was a tremendous change happening in, you know, in social media and social media marketing. I mean, every little nuance of how to do automated, uh, you know, tweets. You have, you know, there was like little nuances like this that we had to learn and, and how to build a process around that, how to make a, how to build a team and a process around each of these functions. We had to learn all of these things on the job. And it's not like these things existed for 10 years before that. So you couldn't get, a, get somebody with 10 years experience in, you know, in, in social media. Forget about a bootstrap company. Even people who were heavily funded couldn't get that kind of experience. So, so having a culture of learning in the organization is tremendously helpful. And, and in particular for bootstrap companies, it's, it's almost like essential because you will not be able to hire you know, very, very experienced uh, executives. So, Bhavin, last question, what is your longer-term thought process regarding Magush, its capitalization, long-term destiny? How are you thinking about the company for the next two, three, five, ten years? Yeah, so, I mean, our, our mission is to provide uh, accessible, enjoyable, and effective uh, education. And so when I think about, you know, should we raise more funding? When I think about all of those things, I think about will it help us achieve our end mission? Will this be best for our students? So, for instance, um, we've chosen not to raise more funding, and we feel like we have what we need to continue moving forward with experiments and continue growing the company. However, if we reach a point at which we feel like we could grow faster and reach more students and improve the experience for students at a faster rate, then we would raise more funding. And so it's not necessarily that I'm opposed to raising money or not. It's more about having a guiding light. And I think that would be my advice for everyone is really these decisions shouldn't be made in a vacuum. You should have a mission and a vision, and you should put it out there, and you should have some values around that. And then you want to use those, that mission and that, those values as a guiding light to how you make your decisions. And so in our case, we want to reach many more students for the GRE and GMAT and then for many other tests. And once we can sort of demonstrate that we're successful in other tests, we'll start to double down on those bets. And if we feel like we don't have the funding to do that, then we'll go out and raise funding. Um, but it's about taking the money you need um, to help grow your business and being really thoughtful about it, rather than just taking money because it might be available, uh, as you might be signing up for something that you didn't really know you were signing up for. Right. And, and you know, the, the thing that – to take away folks in the audience from this discussion, and the reason I brought this topic up is that, you know, right now, Bhavin and Magush are in a state where the company is growing fast, it's executed very well in a very capital efficient way. This is the kind of company that investors want to put more money into. But just because investors want to put a lot of money into a company doesn't mean you should take a lot of money without thinking about it. If you have figured out levers where, you know, if you take $2 million or if you take $5 million and it's going to turn into $20 million or $50 million, then it's worth taking investments. But if you haven't figured that out, that lever out of exactly how you're going to deploy that money to get concrete, you know, growth in the company, then do not take, do not accept capital gratuitously just to experiment because then, you know, every time you're taking money in, your valuation is being set at a certain level. Investors have expectations. So in the next round of investors who come in will then require that your company has an exit at a much, much higher threshold than what you need today. You know, today, Magush has $750,000 in investment, and that's it. So everybody, if, let's say, this company is a 5 to $10 million company, let's say, even if this company gets sold for $50 million, everybody makes money. But if you introduce another $10 million into the company, then the threshold where all the investors, employees, uh, team members, everybody makes money is going to go up. So you have to make that calculation 
you have to be sure that you can deliver to those enhanced expectation levels before you accept investor money. So that's one thing I wanted you to take away from what Pavan is saying. And, and, you know, if you find yourself in this situation, this very wonderful situation where you have the luxury of investors chasing you, and we try to get you there because, you know, our philosophy is bootstrap first, raise money later. So, so we want you to go to investors like kings, not beggars. You want them to come to you. We want them to chase you. Yeah. And as long as you execute well and, and, and deliver on good statistics, good metrics, that situation is very achievable. However, when you get there, if you get there, we want you to be very careful and very responsive, uh, very responsible about what you do with that privilege because you can muck it up. Yeah. You know, if yeah, you take I, too much, you can muck it up. I think you said that really well, Shramana, uh, that idea that when you take a lot of money, you're, you should understand what you're getting into and you should understand investors' expectations. And you should decide for yourself, is that something that you believe in? Is that something that you want? Or do you want something different? And if you want something different, then it's okay to say no or it's okay to tell investors, this is my plan. And if you're on board with my plan, I would consider taking your money. But if not, then, you know, I'll just keep growing the business. Robin, it's been a real pleasure having you, and, and these are all golden nuggets that I wanted our audience to have exposure to. And uh, since you're coming from you, it's, it's very credible because you're in the middle of, you know, executing on a project that is, you know, following all these principles in a very meaningful way. So thank you for sharing your thoughts, and uh, we look forward to keeping in touch. Yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Okay, folks, uh, we are going to switch to the mentoring section of the program. Pavin, are you staying a bit for... Uh... No, unfortunately, I have to head out, so I'm sorry about that. But um, nope. yeah, I'm sure it'll be great. Another time. Thank you. All right, Sorry, Jain, you're up next. If you could please unmute your line and tell us what you're working on, that would be wonderful. Hi, Chamana. Hello, Saurav. I, uh, yeah. Am I audible? Yes, we can hear you. Please go ahead. Oh, excellent. So my name is Saurav Jain. I am working on uh, creating an online marketplace for the solar energy sector for to facilitate the buying of solar energy solution in the country. Now, uh, one thing that we need to you need to note is we are not talking about solar products, say solar lanterns or solar. Uh, you know, panels or modules or inverters. We are talking about turnkey solar projects that can be implemented on uh, rooftops of uh, various buildings for captive mm -hmm. consumption of energy. So, so, so you are uh, talking about creating a marketplace for the contractors and the, the, the people who implement solar projects for residential or commercial solar energy installations, is that what you're saying? Yes, exactly. Uh, I would okay. add to it, uh, we would facilitate buyers to connect with these contractors as well as uh, with investors and banks for financing of these projects. Okay, got it. All right. So, Great. Okay. Uh, can, can I request you to go back to the previous slide so that we can have a look at what kind of projects? Yeah. So there's this picture, we have implemented a solar for a factory. And okay. this is the solution that we are talking about. Okay, so uh, the, uh, the, the, in India, the government is talking about uh, very ambitious targets of capacity addition. We are talking about 40,000 megawatts in distributed generation alone, which means on top of building. Uh, yeah. and, and, and the current installed capacity on top of buildings is around 400 megawatts. So we are talking about 100x capacity addition in the next seven years. Okay. Okay. Now, as of now, there's no marketplace to facilitate buyers to look for such solar solutions. It is on bilateral transaction basis, bilateral discussions between vendors and buyers. And there's a lot of friction in the buying process. Mm -hmm. uh, similar platforms are operational in U.S. and Singapore. And, uh, uh, you know, the U.S. platform for energy sages already been funded by Department of Energy in U.S. 
and and both platforms in US and Singapore have been able to do successful transactions uh, in last two three years. Okay. okay. So what we are saying is our business model is a, a energy consumer, which is a building owner. They can be an industrial building or a residential building or a commercial building. Okay. Hello. Okay. Yep. Now going. They, they, they can come to the platform and the platform will provide them four things. One is recommendation for right solution. Yep. Hello. 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 Hi everybody. It looks like Sermona's phone line may have been disconnected. So if you could just, um, I think our phone died. If you could just bear with us for one minute. This has never happened before, so we appreciate your patience. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Sorry, folks. Somehow or the other, I got dropped. Um, sorry to disrupt the call. Uh, please go ahead, Tarif. Um, okay. So, so in summary, what what we are saying is we are going to simplify the solar energy solution buying process by yeah. recommending a right solution, recommending a right vendor, uh, connecting to multiple finance providers, and facilitating finance and offering a leasing model in case the customer is energy user is not interested in investing any money of his own similar to solar lease uh, uh, offerings in us okay so are you familiar with this company called sanjivity uh, yes yes i am you're essentially doing a concept arbitrage on sanjivity in india yes uh, so not exactly sensitivity, uh, but more of energy sales because sensitivity, uh, I think, to best of my understanding, has his own vendors who go and implement projects, and they offer leasing model only. Mm -hmm. So there are there are, uh, I think there is a lot of similarities. But my point is, this particular business model is more or less validated because of what Sanjivity is doing and, and so forth. So I think it's a, right. it's a reasonable assumption that the business is there. You're right. Okay. Uh, and right. we are at this 
Yeah, okay. Where do you want to start? You have factories, commercial buildings, uh, residential. Where do you see the sweet spot? I would almost recommend that you choose a segment. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what, what, what is your instinct about where you are seeing more okay. traction right now? Okay. Okay, so the, uh, we see a lot of traction in fact industrial and commercial buildings mm -hmm. because their consumption of energy is high. Number two, their tariff is higher than the tariff of residential customers. Mm -hmm. And so, so the uh, return on investment is much better for them. Mm -hmm. okay. So that is the key, key target and the project size is also much, much higher than as compared to residential sector. Okay. All right. So, what uh, what does it look like? How big is a market are we talking about? So, if if we talk about market, so there are two estimates. Uh, as per government plans, we are talking about a uh, market size of uh, total available ma market size of uh, 102 billion rupees in Indian terms by 2022. But that's not my point. My point is, what is your bottom-up market size? How many projects? Yes, yeah, that, that 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 is what our uh, bottom-up market size is. So total market size is three thousand billion rupees, and we expect to earn two percent of on the transaction as a fee. So that two percent works out to sixty rupees. Sorry, sixty billion for EPC uh, revenues from EPC players, and forty-two billion rupees from financing, arranging finance. And what is that in uh, dollars terms? Uh, in dollar terms, uh, so so uh, uh, one billion dollar one uh, one so uh, roughly one point eight billion dollars. Okay, all right. Um, and now, and so, so I think you're you know I think the idea is fine. It's uh, what, do you have already traction? Are you seeing? Have you done projects? Have you tested things yet? So we are we are yet to launch a full fledged online portal. What we have a website, and what we have done so far is offline transactions. So what we are trying to do achieve online through technology, mm -hmm. we have done through offline through consultative selling and yeah. connecting buyers and sellers. Uh, so we have done close to four transactions and earned a revenue of uh, half a million rupees. Okay. And uh, we and I have worked in this industry as an EPC contractor for two years, and uh, clearly there is a need for uh, such a platform because customers are you know extremely confused because it's a high value transaction and uh, uh, the project life is 25 years, so they need to be sure on, you know, what they're buying. And there's a huge gap in terms of pricing offered by various vendors. And, um, sir, what is, what is your assumption about an average uh, contract size when you're doing a particular building? How much revenue are you, as a company, generating off that building? Is this... Uh, uh, so uh, we generate uh, roughly one lakh rupees, so roughly fifteen hundred dollars for installation. For installation, on an average, fifteen hundred dollars from the EPC business, and another thousand dollars if we are able to arrange financing. Financing in India for such projects is at a nascent stage, so we have not earned so far from that. But going forward, we expect twenty five hundred dollar revenue. Uh, on an average from each project. Okay. All right, I got it. So let's uh, go to your questions. Right, so uh, there are at least uh, two uh, startups that are attempt in India that are attempting to, to do exactly something similar, and mm -hmm. both of them have received uh, angel funding. And so my question is, uh, you know, uh, and and our go-to-market strategy relies heavily on online marketing, uh, digital yeah. marketing, and stuff. So uh, how and, and and given the fact that we need funds, heavy funds for digital marketing, and our two of our competitors are angel funded, uh, how, what are your thoughts on can can we bootstrap? How how can we do that? How 
how can we outmaneuver other two funded startups you have to bootstrap to a point where you you have a you know business rolling and then you can get angel funding so i imagine your competitors have already done that so you're you need to do that uh, as well so and, and unfortunately shamna uh, one competitor has yet not launched this but they have received funding and the second one has started with another product category which is solar water heaters they plan mm-hmm. to launch something similar but uh, even before they launch they were able to secure angel funding of uh, uh, 1.2 cr so to i don't know the circumstances of your uh, of these competitors and how they got money and what their relationships are but in general uh, you okay. need to show something uh, you know the good news is you have enough fam here to be able to you know be attractive to investors but you're going to need to show something to okay. you know so a business show a business that has some amount of transactions happening at least a, a small product or a small platform on which these transactions are happening and uh, I, i mean i don't think it's going to take you that long to get there if you can you know do in in the next 3 to 6 months that piece then you will be angel fundable i don't i don't okay. see that it's going to be a this is a fundable situation i think okay excellent it's a That's matter of know. handling that chicken and egg uh, in the next 3 to 6 months and i think it is a fundable situation okay your excellent. next question is important to the tech co-founder if you are going for funding you're going to need to it not not to be a tech co-founder necessarily but you're going to need in-house technology people if you want to go for funding if you're bootstrapping you can do outsourcing and, and all that but yeah, if you're going for funding people are not going to accept that you do not have a technology person in house on board okay uh, okay okay but but uh, as in for example if you have a strategic tie up with an it company uh, is that not acceptable it's not it's, it's not a comfortable situation for uh, for investors generally okay and you can okay. have at least you need somebody in house who's going to be handling technology and then you can have outsourced development you know oh, at least okay. in the beginning you can have outsourced development it's fine but you would want somebody who is going to be you know architecting the solution making the big design decisions and so forth because a scalable marketplace is not not a trivial product to build okay and similarly for marketing uh, well, can we have the tires or investors would also want to come on board in digital you, marketing you will need to have people on the team if you go see if you're bootstrapping a company you can do whatever you want whatever makes sense whatever is pragmatic and and all that is fine if you're going for funding people will want to see more fleshed out teams okay 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 sir um i'm afraid you know we've spent quite a bit of time and i need to move on to the next presenter and if you have yeah so if, if towards the end of the call if you, if time permits can you help me with the fourth point uh, let's come back during q and a okay so hold your questions sure. so let's you know go through more of the sessions and then if we we'll have i think we'll have time for q and a you can ask more questions during q and a okay sure, thanks so yeah thanks so much you're welcome Uh, Shai Krishna Manchi Kanti, you're up next, Bangalore, India. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Shai Krishna from Bangalore, India. Tell us what you're working on. Shai, say, tell us what you're working on. Oh. Looks like you just got... Connected, Ramana. Huh? It looks like he just got disconnected. He got disconnected. Uh oh. Oh, today has been a day of technical glitches. All right, I'm going to fast forward, let him uh, come back, and uh, I'm going to spend some time actually explaining to you how to use one and one in, and uh, we will come back to Sai once he does back in. So um folks everything all the resources that we provide from from 1m 1m rs 1m by 1m.com this is an online program you will find everything on the site now uh in terms of 
starting to immerse yourself in the program, my strong recommendation is to start reading the blog as much as possible. It's free. Yeah. And it's, you'll get a uh, I'm familiar with you with uh, Sai, can you put yourself on mute for a second? I'm, I'm switching to a different segment. I'll come back to you in a moment. I'm um, sorry. Uh, sure, ma'am. Yes. So um, what will what will happen if you start reading the blog in you know in a lot of depth on an ongoing basis? You'll start to get a flavor of the rigor of one million by one million. It is a rigorous program. You know, one million by one million is not a superficial, do a little bit of this and a little, little bit of that kind of program. It is a very rigorous program with very rigorous methodology, very rigorous principles, and it's working. So the best thing about the program is that it's working, so we kind of get more rigorous as opposed to less rigorous so that you, if you follow the method, if you follow the process, we can ensure that you will make progress, you will, you know, achieve success. You can also... Uh, go over the Entrepreneur Journey's book series. We have 12 books in that series, and each of them double-click on a particular topic. All of them are on Amazon Kindle. Some of them are on uh, available as paper books. Not all, but everything is available on Kindle internationally. So this is what our website looks like. You know, you'll find lots of FAQs in, um, you know, within the program. I know many of you come here to the program with the question, can 1M1M one &one help me raise money? So right here on your screen, you'll find a video FAQ that goes through all the you know, pieces of our answer to that question. The answer is complex. You know, you, we can help you raise money if you're fundable. However, remember that over 99% of the entrepreneurs out there do not get funding, are not, many of them are because, do not get funding because they're not fundable. Not everything is fundable. A very large majority of the entrepreneurs out there need to build their businesses as bootstrap businesses. We are, 1M1M is the only, uh, you know, accelerator in the world that actually has a strong emphasis on helping bootstrap entrepreneurs become successful. Absolutely, we work with entrepreneurs who get funded and whom we help raise funding, but we also are committed to helping those of you who will perhaps not be, become fundable, but will be able to build successful multi-million dollar businesses. So both flavors of entrepreneurship are okay with us, and if your business has characteristics of getting funded, of qualifying for funding, we will absolutely help you raise money. Now, these free roundtables are a great place for you to come and get a quick, you know, conversation with me, So that, especially if you're trying to decide whether you want to join the program or not. This is a great place to come and have a quick conversation, and, and you know, it will help you make that decision whether you want to join the program or not. We've done tons of these sessions. Um, if you want to do that, please go to the free public roundtable page and register to pitch or to attend. The premium program is where we do the bulk of our, you know, hands-on health work, and it is a very rigorous program. So it is not for everybody. If you're not someone who can take a lot of self-learning material and, and really work at your own pace and, and without spoon-feeding, without a lot of hand-holding, this program will probably not be the best um, venue for you to learn. There may be other programs where you'll get, you know, a lot more shepherding and hands-on, uh, you know, spoon feeding. I don't know which programs do that. I can't say off the top of my head that, you know, here's a program that will give you a lot more spoon feeding. But I, what, what I can tell you is, you know, entrepreneurs typically have to be self-starters. Entrepreneurs who become successful have to be self-starters. They have to be, you know, self-learners, and those who are, those who fit that general characteristic pretty much self-select themselves for success into the one and one -on program. And then we offer you extensive methodology guidance. We have a great curriculum, and you have to study. You have to commit to studying that curriculum, 50 to 100 hours of studying using, a, you know, video lectures and case study-based curriculum. We will help you with business development. We will introduce you to tons of people, customers, channel partners, investors, media, analysts, other mentors, other advisors. We'll, you know, 
we have a tremendous resource here for you. There are strategy consulting sessions like these. There are private premium member only roundtables where we do the interactive coaching. So it's a very solid, very robust program, and it's a very high value program. You know, we offer you $375,000 worth of value uh, plus, you know, the equivalent of what we offer for just a $1,000 annual membership fee would be $375,000 in cash plus 5 to 10 percent of equity. And that's, you know, that value equation, that ROI equation is tremendous. But you have to be the kind of person who's willing to work within the framework of one million, million by one million. We are not going to customize the program for your personality type. And, and if you come and tell us that, oh, you know, I don't want to do all this studying. You help me. You kind of solve my problems. You help me, you know, do this and that. That's not how it works. You are going to have to help yourself. We are teaching you how to fish. We're not catching fishes and giving them to you. That's not, we don't believe that's the way to teach um, you to be successful. And this is, you know, this is a long-term investment in you as an entrepreneur. Our assumption also is that you're going to be most likely a serial entrepreneur. So you want to learn how to do this, um, you know, this whole program, whole process of how to build a company and put one foot before the other so that you can do it over and over and over again if you choose to do so. So if you go to the web page, the home page, you'll find uh, links on how to quantify the one and one and value equation, orientation material, how to use the program effectively and so forth. The self-assessment will give you a very good tool set of questions to ask about your question, so um, about your business. So these are questions that I will ask you. These are questions that investors will ask you. These are questions that you should ask yourself. That's really, really important. So that's one million by one million. You'll find tons of information on the website on you know how what to expect from the premium program. We suggest that you really dig into the website, really you know, get all your questions answered before you make the decision to join the program because very possibly you will be staying in the program not for one year but two, three, four, five years. And we are, there's no concept of graduation from the program or expiration. As long as you maintain your subscription to the program, you're welcome to use the program and we will continue to work with you. We have many entrepreneurs who stay in the program for many years. So, we are interested in long-term relationships with entrepreneurs who are building solid companies over the longer term. And, uh, and it takes a long time to build companies. It's not a fly-by-night thing, and we are looking for people who have the stamina to do that. The curriculum, by the way, is taught in case studies and video lectures. We have had over 600 successful entrepreneurs participate in building this curriculum share their case studies, their journeys, their advice, their lessons from the trenches, and that's what's powering this program, the experiences of over 600 very successful entrepreneurs. Over 50 of these are unicorn companies, billion dollar plus valuation, and over 350 are highly valued companies with lots of venture capital funding. And then we also have tons of bootstrapped entrepreneurs. So you learn all flavors of entrepreneurship through the curriculum. We have a core with seven topics, bootstrapping, positioning, market sizing, customer validation, financing, customer acquisition, and team building. Then we have electives that are Web 3.0 e-commerce, health computing and business solutions, outsourcing and consulting, mobile and social apps, healthcare IT, et cetera. So these are different industry sectors. We have a module in the electives on how to build an unicorn companies, and so forth. So you'll learn a lot through the program, but you have to be willing to learn, you know? That is the big differentiator on whether you will succeed in the one and one program or not. It is rigorous. You need to be a person who is capable of working within a very rigorous framework. And our methodology, as we discussed with Pavin earlier, is lean, capital efficient, bootstrap startups. And even if you raise money later, you're going to have to bootstrap your way to validation. We also have lots of relationships and cloud in the media. We use that to help you get your word out there, whether it's through social media or through other, you know, media channels. We have the ability to get you out there 
So use those channels, those one-on-one -on -one channels, to, to amplify your message. And if you're trying to build a community, an entrepreneurship community somewhere in the world, wherever it is, you're very welcome to partner with the one-on-one -on -one -on affiliate program. We have roundtables every week going forward um, in July. So you'll have lots of slots to pitch and uh, interact with us. And Vision India 2020 is the 13th book in our, you know, roster, uh, in our catalog. This book is an ideation book. It is a business fiction book set in, in 2020, and we have tackled $45 billion business ideas. You can take any of these, and if you still haven't come up with an idea and looking for one, take one of these and, and flesh it out and see if you want to execute on one of these ideas. We also have an incubator in a box, which companies and other partners, other kinds of partners like governments and investors can use to build their own incubation programs. And we primarily have partnerships with corporations at this point along those lines. We are you know, in the process of building some other kinds of partnerships as well, but so far historically mostly corporates. All right, so that's what we have in terms of um, you know, information about 1M, 1M, and how to use the program. What is the situation, Maureen, um, of the presenters? Are they dialed in? Is somebody dialed in that I should go back to a presentation for? Otherwise, we are open for Q&A. So those of you who are in the room and if you would like to call in and engage in Q&A, please do that. You can also ask questions in public chat. I will take questions from public chat as well. Now, I am going to go to Sai Krishna and uh, do his slide deck while you guys are lining up your questions. So let me go to Sai's presentation. Hi, ma'am. Uh, I'm Sai Krishna. Yes. Go ahead, Sai. Tell us what you're working on. Uh, hi, ma'am. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I'm the founder of uh, M Hotspot. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so my team is uh, three people. Yeah. Uh, second slide, please. Hello? Go ahead, Ty. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, so, Hotspot uh, is an app that turns your uh, Windows laptop into a Wi-Fi hotspot or a media hub so that it can transfer the files from the laptop to uh, multiple client devices. Okay. So, uh, the website is uh, mhotspot.com, as you can see on the second slide. These are my credentials. Uh, my, you can contact me there. And moving on to the third slide, uh, I'll prepare in short about this product. So, um, so, 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 you you have this product already running. You already have launched this product. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, it's already on the market. And currently, it has uh, five million downloads, and okay. it's growing at the rate of uh, two hundred thousand downloads per month. Okay. And are these uh, free so downloads? Uh, these five million plus downloads are free downloads. Yes, no, completely uh, free download. We did not do any uh, advertising also for that. So you're the 35,000 USD of revenue is advertising revenue? Yes, ma'am. That's the advertising revenue from the app itself. Uh, so we do not include the revenue from the website, uh, website advertisement. So if you include that, uh, the revenue will be around 50,000 USD for the last year. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's uh, great. That's uh, so excellent. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, currently, right now, uh, the Enhancepot uh, acts as an internet uh, sharing uh, software. Uh, but what my goal is to bring this uh, Windows compatible software to multiple platforms uh, so that uh, the numerous devices can be accessing the internet as well as uh, transferring the files. Uh, I believe these days, majority of users have multiple devices, whether it's a laptop or a phone or a phone or a tablet. Yeah. And like you know, a different combination. The major uh, drawback or uh, a difficulty, an unnecessary difficulty, uh, is like you know the accessing data. Let us say, for example, if you have your 
some uh, documents, or let us say, uh, a vacation pictures on your uh, phone, but you need to access them on your uh, computer. Generally, the traditional way will be connecting the phone to the uh, computer via USB, but instead, uh, the MHOT pod can directly stream those files from your, uh, from your phone to laptop or vice versa. So, um, Sai, I, you know, one thing that as, you, as I'm looking at your slide of 5 million plus downloads and 35,000 yes, units in revenue, one thing, one question that comes to my mind is, why is the revenue number so low against the 5 million downloads? If you have 5 yeah. million C users, 5 million is a substantial number, why is the revenue mm -hmm. level not much, much, much higher? Yeah, uh, it's because uh, we do not show uh, uh, aggressive advertisements in the app, and uh, right now the advertising is only shown once uh, for any user at the time of installation. That's it. So why is that? Uh, why have you made that choice not to show advertisements in the app? Yeah, it's because uh, we wanted to uh, provide the best UX for the users until uh, we reach a huge number of uh, user base, like loyal user base. Uh, right now, as you can but see, you know, if you uh, want have, investors uh, to be interested in your company, we need to see a, a path to monetization. Thirty-five thousand US dollars is not interesting to any investor. The question here is, how are you going to build, build a billion-dollar business based on your, you know, uh, the business that you are proposing to do here? And where is the, what is the monetization model for this? Is my question. Uh, yes, ma'am. So currently, uh, when I bring the investors on board. Uh, we are going to uh, remove the advertisement completely, and uh, we will we'll employ a premium uh, sales model. Uh, for example, right now the hotspot is only for Windows laptop, and mm -hmm. an additional Android app is under development uh, to uh, access the content that is like you know uh, a video streaming or like you know uh, transferring the files. Uh, so for this client app, uh, that we are going to expand to uh, iOS and Windows and. If possible, the rest of the platform, we can charge uh, a one-time fee uh, to download the app. So mm -hmm. we can obviously uh, raise the funds from that. And the reason we are uh, seeing such low revenue currently is like, you know, as I already mentioned, we don't want to go for aggressive advertising so that the app gets bad uh, reviews and all. You know, my sense on this product would be to do some sort of a premium uh, pricing on maybe if you give the app for free and people use it and, and maybe there's a finite number of downloads they do for free, uh, you know, a finite number of files that they share for free and up to which they need to pay. That, that would be my guess in terms of monetization and I think that would monetize a lot better. Okay, ma'am. Uh, and one thing regarding like the content please like, you know, uh, providing uh, uh, what we call uh, providing the, uh, both the desktop app and uh, the client that requires to access the file for so free. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think uh, more people will be inclined to uh, uh, what we call uh, yeah see the ads on a regular basis because uh, as you can see, this app uh, they need to use it like multiple times. Uh, uh, they need to use the app frequently. So I think if you provide the option of, for the premium sales uh, by removing the ads, a lot of people will be interested, like, you know, from the time we come down to, like, uh, so that they won't be tracking their uh, habits to show targeted ads and all. So I think that would be a better experience for these. Uh, just pay a uh, one-time fee and get rid of all the ads. That's what I, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm doing now. My, my point is I, you know, I'm, I'm almost my instinct, and, and you have to validate this, I'm not going to impose this instinct on it. My my point is you're going to do better in a product like this sure. with a subscription business model than an advertising, or that at one time charge business model. It could be a recurring charge business model. It could be a monthly fee kind of business model. Yeah. Not a one time. That's also good idea, I think, subscription model. Hmm? Yeah, I would prefer to see a subscription model yeah. here. And I think investors oh, would prefer to see a subscription right. model. Yeah, so your question about is there any you know, standard way to decide how much equity should be given to the in investors, this is a question that uh, it, it cannot be answered in a, in a thumb rule basis. I'll be happy to help you ne negotiate your, uh, with your investors and, and so forth, but uh, this is not a question I can answer in a thumb rule basis. 
<laughs> okay, ma'am. So I, I try to avoid some rules based on questions, like you know how to get the minimum standard. So I I just thought I think this question will be a more valid. But uh, anyway, ma'am, I, I just found the answer from you. And one thing, ma'am, if you don't mind, I like to ask uh, one more question. Come again. I can't okay. hear you very well. You need to speak up a bit. Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, can I ask you one more question, ma'am? Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, sure, ma'am. Uh, so, uh, as you have seen my uh, this app model and the further expansion uh, plans, uh, is it like you know a viable uh, app or software likely to go for the funding? Will the investors be uh, interested in such kind of software? Potentially, but you, the presentation that you've made is not adequate to to have investor conversations. There's a, you know the investor conversations require a certain set of points in a you know in that pitch. So if, I'll, I'll be happy to work with you to put that together. It's conceivable that you have all that in, in, in your business, but some of these decisions on what is going to be the pricing model, what is going to be the business model of your business, all these issues need to be ironed out before investors would be willing to engage with you. It could, it's possible, but I don't have enough information yet, and, and there are some of these issues that are open still that need to be fleshed out before we can have that uh, conversation with investors. Yes, ma'am. Okay? Sure, ma'am, sure. But happy to yes, work with you. Uh, thanks for you know, you've, done, you've done one thing that very well, which is you've got a product that works, that people yes. are downloading yes. and using, and, and you've got some amount of monetization out of it. That's a very good start. Yes. And, and we can build on that uh, and, and you help, you become, help you become a successful business. All right, Ty, thank you for your presentation. Good uh, good progress so far. It's good to see that you're making, uh, you know, inroads into a category in a nice, you know, successful way. Uh, Saurav, you have sure, a couple of other questions that you wanted to go up, uh, go address. One is uh, business model and scaling up. Uh, you know, marketplace business models tend to scale reasonably well. The question in your case is, can you put together reliable contractors in you know all over India, who are going to be able to fulfill your orders? If they don't, then you will not be able to scale this marketplace, and that is a non-trivial problem. And then you have a question: How do we ensure non-circumvention by customers and sellers? Besides ratings, reviews, which companies are doing this effectively? All the marketplaces are doing this effectively, whether it's eBay, uh, Amazon Marketplace, uh, Elance, Odesk. Um, you know, there are all kinds of marketplaces where you will see this. So study the marketplaces and see how they do it. You you have to deal with that as an issue um, in, you know, in your work. The, to do the marketplace business in any category, you have to deal with the non-circumvention issue and you have to build in non-circumvention parameters. Okay, I'm going to take questions from the public chat. Prabhu Kumar is asking how to get funding I'm from Bangalore, India. We want to be an Uber for elderly people. Well, Prabhu, uh, there's a whole range of things that you have to do to get funding before, you know, you're ready to be, in, you know, ready to talk to investors. So if you are operating, operating on a pure concept level, this is not the right time to seek funding. You're going to need to put a business together, do some validation, etc., and Investors typically do not fund concepts, they fund businesses. So you have to get from a concept to business, and then, you know, there will be opportunities for funding. And if you decide that you want to join 1M1M, I'll be happy to work with you to help you through that whole process. Um, Tracy Neal, let me read out. It's a long question. I will read it out. In addition to my consulting business, I have a drink product that I've created that has a special ingredient that is sourced from India. Right now, I produce it for myself, family, and friends. I currently buy the ingredient from a local Indian store, but I'm ready for a full product launch. I have already identified a few Indian manufacturers and a co-packer in the U.S., but due to lack of mentoring and funding, I haven't been able to move forward. The ingredient has been missing a key element, branding. I'm confident I've solved the issue. I already have a logo and trademark labeling and packaging. However, I'm having the following challenges. 
as the A hurdles detailing the route to market and intense resistance from alternative ingredients that are currently in the market. I'm confident the product will be a success, but now I'm considering launching the product outside of the U.S. Can one of one and help me prioritize, flush out the route route to market and navigate the best geography for product launch? So, Tracy, one thing uh, I want to caveat for you as far as one and one is concerned, our focus is IT and IT-enabled services. Consumer product launch is not our sweet spot unless you're doing electronic commerce or, you know, something to do with online brands or online businesses. If you're trying to launch a pure CPG product into shelves at retail stores, this is not our sweet spot. So uh, I don't want to misrepresent where we can help you, where we cannot help you. Um, Ricky Goswami says, I would like to talk to Stramana regarding content marketing. Um, I'm not sure what you would like to talk. Okay, your question is related to MVP like Pavin did or 1M1M one one does. We have a product that can relate it to e-commerce store owners. It's an e-commerce site search product. I wish to know how I can connect with some initial e-commerce store owners to validate my big idea, first 100 customers or first 20 to 100 customers. I'm pretty active on Quora, 6,000 answer views in the last 30 days or other forums, helping them in conversion, optimization, and e-commerce marketing. I have a landing page in the making and will be doing PPC as well next week. Is there anything more I can do for content marketing or any other type of market? Ricky, the thing that you should do is you should go to e-commerce stores that are in your sweet spot, the kind of customers you're looking for that, does, that do not have good site search, and go pitch them directly. Find the CEO or the you know, VP of engineering in those sites and go pitch them directly, use LinkedIn to network with them and, and go pitch them directly. Prabhu Kumar says we have an MVP and we have traction. That's great if you have MVP and if you have traction, then um, you can start, you know, depending on what level of traction and, and what you have done in terms of your investor pitch and so forth, you should be able to contact investors and, and raise funding. Now, if you are interested in being introduced to investors and so forth, you need to join the one and one m program and we will work with you to get your collaterals ready as well as introduce you to investors. Venkatesh Chenakesa Bhulla says, I'm planning to build a social networking site. How can I differentiate my site from others? This is a very big question, Venkatesh. My recommendation to you is, you know, I can't answer this question in, you know, in two minutes here. My, my suggestion to you would be to join the program and, uh, and study and learn the methodology of bringing a new product to market, and, and that would be the fastest way that I can help you. You really need to learn how to position a product, bring a product to market, and so forth, and it sounds like your current level of understanding of what entrepreneurship is all about is, is very, very basic. So you really, at a very accelerated pace, need to enhance that knowledge really quickly, and the only way I know how to do that from my point of view to help you is to advise you to join the one in one program. Anybody else? Questions, comments, issues, introductions? If this is also a networking session, so if you'd like to introduce yourself, tell us where you're joining from, what kind of projects you're working on, what your issues are, what your challenges are, now is a very good time to do that in the public chat or by calling in. And while you're doing that, I want to introduce you to Irina Patterson. If you have questions about the 1M1M one one program, feel free to email Irina at 1Mby1M.com. And uh, she'll also be happy to get on the phone or Skype with you if necessary, but start with email. And um, she, will, you know, she will help you enhance your understanding of the program. Irina has asked me to make one point to all of you. It's a question that she's getting constantly. Um, the question is, when is a good time to join one, one million by one million? And my answer to that is join as fast as possible, as soon as possible, as early in your cycle as possible, so that you don't go down paths that are not going to yield success. We have a lot of experience in prioritizing and, and in figuring out where to spend energy, where, you know, to, to spend your resources. So. The earlier you start working with us, 
the earlier we can put you on a deterministic path to success, and that's very valuable in the long run because you don't want to waste, waste six, nine, you know, 18 months fussing around. Fussing around is very expensive in a startup uh, life cycle. All right. Anybody else? Questions, comments? Sarah Jain, please send your questions to all participants. This is a public chat. Your question is, one and one site mentions a fee that is large enough plus a percent fee other than US dollar 1,000 fee. Can you please share when this percent fee is payable? Well, there is no percent fee. The ROI equation is that for a $1,000 annual membership fee, you're getting value worth $375,000 and 5 to 10% equity. If you were to try to get the amount of services and the amount of value that we create for you in the 1M1M program is equivalent to $375,000 worth of cash plus 5 to 10% of equity. And what we charge is just $1,000 and no equity. So what you, I think what you're referring to is the value equation, the ROI analysis, not our fee. Our fee is just the $1,000 annual membership fee. Ricky Goswami is asking, uh, he's introducing himself, Ricky Goswami, building a product that increases sales of e-commerce stores by up to 40%. And he's asking you to drop a line to him if you own an e-commerce store and, and want help with conversion and sales. Very good. Anybody else? Any other introductions, questions, comments, issues? Yes? No? I see Shailendra Hanumanthi is hand up. Would you like to ask a question? Would you like to dial in or do you want to ask a question in public chat? Here's the dial-in number, if that's what you prefer to do, and just let us know in public chat that you're dialing in. All right, if you don't have any more questions or comments, we will meet you back here next week. If you want to pitch, please let Maureen know and she will schedule you. And uh, I look forward to working with all of you, whether it's here in the, you know, free public round post, or if you join the premium program, I look forward to working with you more extensively and more continuously in the premium roundtables as well as in the program itself. See you next week. Bye, everybody. Thank you for coming today.